One of the things that I want to remind us of um, is that we're in a series on, on vision, and this week, Dawn Pratt and I were going to um, do a team teaching, and, and so two days ago, I looked at the forecast. This seems, oh, this seems loud and like a little bit reverb. Um, and so like two days ago, or three days ago now, it was like 12 to 14 inches, and <laughs> yeah, so I was like, ooh, let's, let's postpone this, you know? And so she and I are going to do a team teaching next week. Um, so I, I wanted to carve out some time to share with you a little different uh, talk this morning. But before I get to that, I think it's important um, whenever we talk about vision is just to be reminded of things, you know? And in the first week that we did this, um, it, was, it was actually very humbling and amazing. And I, and I just want to reiterate it to you because we're talking about um, what I believe God has envisioned this church to be, right? We, we talk about this all the time. All churches have their own DNA, right? Their own personal thumbprint. And, and I started off week one, and I just wanted you guys to get the heartbeat of you all being the church and how much you bless one another and how much you bless the people in your lives. And the numbers are kind of staggering. Like, I, I said this, we gave over $20,000 to people in this church, because just there was need. And, and I'm almost like nervous to say that because it becomes like a standard and I don't want it to be a standard. The standard is just be generous, right? When you see someone in need, we try to do what we can to meet that need. But God blessed us in like these incredible ways through, um, I would suggest, not quote unquote the, the normal giving patterns of most people. It was like above and beyond. And as those monies came in though, it was like the timing was like impeccable where I was like, there's a, there's a person who's in need and we're talking about thousands of dollars in need. And I said, gosh, like what can we possibly do? And I'm like, okay, in faith, let's try to meet that need. And then it's like a week later, this influx of money's come in that's like the unexpected. And, I, and I'm always blown away because we talk about God as our provider. We talk about this God that we should know and to come to trust. And, and yet it's almost always on the other side of stepping out with trembling trust. You know what I mean? It's like as you step out and you take a risk and you go, okay, God, I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to trust you. And then all of a sudden on the backside, you're blown away by his generosity. And it doesn't always work out that way, and that's fine. But when it does, it's like just this amazing beauty that's just so humbling. And I want you to, to feel the weight of that because it is just God's... Um, his favor and his love and his way of showing you the depths of his care. Um, and I think about the early church. It's hard because it doesn't translate perfectly, right? Because there was such a agricultural society and they were always walking together. And, and so every day they were on a journey together. And I feel like um, it's harder when you're, when you're just showing up and we see each other maybe once a week, you know, maybe. And you're trying to catch up in your life and you're trying to find out what's going on. And, and so it's like this idea of like, how can we be present with each other to know each other's story? Because it's in the story. It's in when I know you're in pain, when I know there's a need, it's like, then we can show up and be the church. We can show up and come alongside and we can come and pray and we can come and offer whatever it is in Acts 2 when it talks about the church just sharing together all that they had for those that were in need. And it's like a beautiful picture. And I think that we, we catch glimpses of that. And that's why I kind of want to just reemphasize. It's like, you all are that to one another. And it's just as beautiful to be on the receiving side as it is to be on the giving side. And, um, and I just want you to, to look at God's beauty through his church, meaning through you. Because each person represents God's church. And then just the other side of that is in our desire to, to care for others in our communities. Um, we, we spent over 4,400 hours serving our community, and we spent over 1,500 hours serving inside the church here. And it just, just reminds me of when people say yes to God and just say, yes, I'm available, and I want you to use me that God can do in and through us. And so feel good about that. And then last week we talked about why we exist is to experience God, 
to, to have this unbelievable relationship with, with a God that we can't often see and touch and feel and all these different things, and yet we walk in this, in this trust. We walk in this faith, and, and we try to figure out, we talked about like the rhythm of that, right? Like it's, it's not easy to, um, to experience God on a regular basis. You know, and so Laurie shared from the church where she was talking about, like we talked about the void. And, and even as Christians, it's like you can experience like the void of being like where you feel really, really close and connected to God, but other times where you feel like separated or disconnected or just, it's just out of rhythm. And, and so as a church, we want to come around us and say, how can we help us all as individuals and collectively experience God? You know, and, and, and maybe have those, those voids or those doldrums or disconnected be less often. You know, and, and even in those times, maybe the church comes alongside you in, a diff- in some different way. Um, and that's the beauty. And uh, I just want to make a quick announcement on this idea of experiencing God. So what we're trying to do is on the, um, the last Sunday of each month, just for the next few months, and it starts next Sunday, is that we're going to do like a, just a time of prayer and worship. I really want to raise up the value this year of just um, time in prayer. And so if you can avail yourselves, I think it's at 6 o'clock next Sunday night. And we just kind of come in here and set up the chairs and just are quiet in God. And, and the music team will, will play some songs and stuff like that. But I really want to emphasize our need for prayer. You know, like that we need prayer personally. We need prayer collectively. We need prayer in our homes and our families and our communities and our jobs our nation, and our world, you know? And so, um, so we'll do that for the next three months, definitely. That, that's what's scheduled, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. But if you can come to that, that'd be awesome. This morning, I wanted to take a few minutes to, to share with you uh, our, our st- strategy. Like, it's a strategic framework in which we, we think through uh, everything that we do in church, and it's a strategy that supports ministry. And so I think it's important when we talk like this that you get the heart of it, you know, like I'm going to try not to make it like this, you know, bullet point type of thing, but I do want you to see the, the framework in which we, we think things through because I want you to be joining us in prayer and being effective at these things because the more effective we get, the more good that God can do th- in us and through us. So I'm just simply share with you from Proverbs 24, and it's the importance of wisdom. You know, when I talk about prayer, prayer and wisdom goes hand in hand. This idea that we, we have to stay connected to God, and as we listen to his voice, he will pour out his wisdom. And Proverbs captures it this way. It says, by wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. What I love about that, that word picture, if you will, it's a coming alongside. If any of you have had like house projects, and you've had other people come in and, and help you with that, and you think about God as the, the originator of that and the orchestrator of that, and as you do that together, I guess this coming to my mind the other day, um, I think it was last week. Was it last weekend at Four Echoes when the, the pipes burst? Okay, so last Saturday, I just thought this is so, I, I've been telling people about this story because it was like an awful thing to happen, but it was a beautiful thing to happen. And that's oftentimes how God's church comes to be, right? There's a need, and then that was unexpected. Things didn't go as planned. Pipes burst. You know, a 13,000 square foot building, that's not fun, <laughs> right? And then you get the call and go, oh, okay, right? We got sh- we to gotta be there. And so Kara was, was uh, well, Misty was out on site at the time and called up Kara. And then, so then Kara and Rich showed up and then Nate showed up and Dennis and Renee showed up and Diane and I showed up. And, and it was like, and I'm just like watching this happen because like <laughs> as, as water's pouring out of the pipes, <laughs> You know, I'm watching the team just like get in, you know, and just like this, this was one of the, um, the units there was very like packed with like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small items, right? So it's like one cup after another. I think there was like a thousand cups, you know, it's like, okay, assembly line, you know, let's just get this thing going. But as that's happening, I'm being reminded of like this idea of a house being built, that we're joining God in his mission and, and something didn't go as planned. It didn't surprise God, but it was an opportunity for the church to be the church. And I'm just watching everyone just chip in and just make it happen, you know, and, and you're watching gifts come forth, right? Like, so, so Nate and Dennis, they took on the, 
the fun part, I would suggest, because I'm not skilled, I couldn't do it, but they're like cutting the pipes and soldering the pipe. They got this blowtorch thing going. I'm like, that looks cool. You know, I want to get in on that. They wouldn't let me touch it. You know, you just keep taking the stuff down the hall. You just keep taking this. All right. Right. And so, but you're, you're just watching everyone chip in. And, and it's a, to me, that's a microcosm of God's global church. Like if you just, right, just sit back for a second, think about that. Think about the needs in the world. Who was sharing with me something about food? Anyone here in this room that's sharing with me about food? Was it you, Mark? I don't know. Someone told me last night, it might have been your brother, Matt, about the food shortage in the world, right? Where we talk about like people starving to death. And it was like this staggering statistic. It was like, I think it was like one day of waste in the United States could feed the whole world. And I was sitting there going, like, that's a sobering statistic just to get your mind around. But but sometimes we want to blame God for, for not being a provider. And yet, wait a second, look at the surplus, look at the grace, look at the generosity of our God, and yet he's looking to human beings, his church, to, to understand the need and the plight and understand that your neighbor is not just the neighbor next to you, but it's your global neighbor too. And, and the church has this reach, right? It, it reaches to every part of the earth. And if we would just be the church, what could happen? And so you catch glimpses of it, right? And, and that's why we talk about a lot here. We'll talk about how God has a, has a way where he's like, heaven and earth interlock at times. They overlap at times. And when you see that, it's like, oh my, it's like those stories you go, God showed up. If it weren't for God, right, dot, dot, dot. And it's in those moments that we're reminded of his goodness. And we're reminded of like, keep going. Keep urging one another on. Keep doing what, you, what you're here on this earth to do. And keep using your gifts and your passions and, and just get in the game and start serving, right? And this is all built on wisdom from God. And it starts with a discerning heart and discerning spirits for a collective group of people say, God, I'm going to lay down my agenda and I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to do the very best that I can to, to humble myself, open up my eyes, my heart, my, my ears, and listen to you, God, and trust that you're leading us and guiding us. I love days when you wake up and you start with God, right? And then throughout the day, all of a sudden, he places people in your life that you weren't expecting. And a God moment happens. Those are some of the most amazing, beautiful days. And I feel like they would happen more often if, and I'll say I, if I would start my day with Christ and just say, God, let your will be done. Let me just be showing up, listening, and watching for what you're doing. And then when the occasion arises, let me jump in. And not be afraid, but to look at it as this is a divine encounter that you had planned. And so if we can keep doing that, I think that's like probably the most fun thing about being in Christ, is that, that adventure. And so let me just back up for a second on talking a little bit about the church and, and how this dy dynamic happens in rhythm. So for two and a half years, we started 2016 in April, and we wanted to start by, we, there's a value, there's a statement that we said that we're going to be, um, like, be organic, yet intentional. We really wanted to start with a church that had, like, cultural values where people, like the song, Mark, was, come as you are, right? It was a, it's a song that we sing on a regular basis because we wanted just people just to come and just be who you are, but be a participant in joining us in what we're doing. And we were just really hoping that organically a lot of things would just happen, right? So as that's going on and, and leading that way and setting culture, and recognize that culture takes years and years and years to develop, right? Um, so in that, though, we're recognizing there's certain things that we're like, ah, oh, man, I wish we could get a little better at, a little stronger at, a little healthier in, right? And so, for example, um, an example could be like helping people get better connected sooner, right? That's just an example I'm using. So as new people coming in through the doors, you know, instead of just organically, and I'll say this, I hope organically that all of you see yourselves as greeters, because we are, right? You don't have to have a title of greeter to go up and be friendly to people and say, hey, welcome to Stone Close, glad that you're here, you know, get into a conversation with people. So yes, culturally, organically, I hope that happens all the time. However, you know, because I find like I'm, it's, we're probably not doing as good a job as I'd like is helping people get connected as soon as possible, we're going to try to get better infrastructure, you know, and get a little more things in place so that can happen more regularly. You know, so that's just a real small example of it. But we kind of flip that saying around and say, so now let's be intentional, 
get organic, right? And you see the difference, and so we'll examine that over the next couple of years. And, and what are the, what's the fruit of that? Because we're still at the core of us, we're still human beings, right? We're all imperfect. And we, so we come through these doors and we say, um, another one of our cultural values, like we're not trying to be a consumeristic church. Like we don't want to be a church of consumers. We want to be a church of participators, participants. I sometimes use words, I don't know if they're words, but participators, it sounds good, you know? Um, it's like gladiators participating, right? So you're participators. And so in that, it's like, but we all come with needs, right? So every one of us comes through the door with needs. So that's just the human element. But it, so if I stay, stay organic, stay organic, stay organic, then a lot of times it's going to stay consumer level. But if we can be a little more intentional, right, and then it can be like, all right, understanding our needs, that's just human nature, will come around that. And then we can be more effective. And so it, I think it just helps us to love each other better and, and do things, I would suggest, in a, more healthy, in a more healthy way. All right. If you have questions as I'm talking, like this is a great Sunday where it's just like, hey, raise your hand, ask me a question. Okay, so I'll say that now. <laughs> And in that, I'm going to do the Bible reading, but we'll, instead of standing, traditionally we, we, we stand, just, just sit, and let me just read to you um, from Luke 6, 46 to 49, and again, it's just talking about from God's perspective how to build a healthy foundation. It starts this way, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. So just stop there for a second. I want you to see the, the rhythm again of how this works. There's a, why don't we want to be a consumer-minded church is this very reason. Right in God's scripture, it's calling us to practice his word, practice his ways. He came to establish a movement and a kingdom. So in that, it is, it is organic, it is fluid, it is moving. But he's looking to us and saying, will you practice putting this stuff into, uh, into your lives on a regular basis. So an example would be a real simple one, yet extremely difficult, and all of us struggle with this, is the ideal of forgiveness. If we do a teaching on forgiveness, every one of us would probably say, yes, absolutely. You know what? Forgiveness is vitally important. It's going to keep our relationships in a healthy place. And yet, when we're offended, how difficult is it to practice what the Word says? Right? And so there's a disconnect. But if we do, it says, I will show you what they are like. So God continues to reveal himself in his ways to us. And then he goes on, they are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So what I'm about to share with you is our infrastructure, our strategic framework to hopefully give us a really great foundation for God to build his church upon, right? God's going to build his church regardless but we get to be participants in that. And so let me just go through this rather quickly. But if you have questions on it, please let me know. So put up the slide where it has the bullet points. Well, this is what I'm just going to share each of these. And I'm just going to give you examples. So you can just leave that up there, Will. But as a church, we, we have to develop strategy around each person that comes through the doors. Right? We want every single person to, to have this relationship with God that changes their lives and transforms them from the inside out. So many of you have had that experience. And if you haven't yet, that's fine. You're on that journey, right? But for those of us who have had that experience in Christ where we received him as our Lord and Savior, and it changed the trajectory of our lives, it changed the very reason and purpose of why we're here. Think about that. Every individual, I long for them to have that experience because it's in that where all of a sudden you start to see beyond yourself. And every day when you wake up, there's possibilities of teaming up with God and what he wants for us. And so we spend a lot of time thinking that through. Like uh, One of the things that we talk about, like we did last week, is this idea of how can we help people realize and experience God lifestyle, right? This idea that as we draw close to God, he is now drawing close to us. As we're listening to his spirit and being led by him, 
we're going to be doing his work and contributing to building his kingdom. And so we want to continue to figure out different ways to be intentional as a church to put forth different tools and resources and series that we do and different mechanisms to help you all as individuals to grow in your relationship with Christ. And so we'll keep coming back to that experiencing God um, mindset, if you will. And then another big piece of this, I've had a lot of people over the years tell me they could be 40, 50, 60 years old and come to me and say, I still don't realize why I'm here. You know, like, what's my purpose? Like, what, what, I don't even feel like I'm good at anything. And it, like, breaks my heart having those conversations because it's like, wait a second. The truth of God's word, like that song that we just sang, what's the lyric? I am who he said I am something? I am who you say I am. That's a powerful, powerful phrase because we say who we are a lot of times by what other people say about us or what our parents said about us or what this person who stabbed us in the back said about us. And we bring that on as if it's the truth. And God has to work through us to bring healing so that we don't believe the lie. I am who God said I am. The most beautiful thing in all the world if you could realize the fullness of that. Keep grasping that. So we want to create different opportunities for us to come together. So yes, as individuals, but also as, as small groups of people to have an experience where you get with other people and you try to have those conversations over a meal, right? Just in a home and just be yourselves, but start talking about these types of things. And maybe there'll be little tools that we can provide for you, right? You can do these assessments and whatnot and get a good feel for how God wired you because you're all good at something. You're all, you're all passionate about certain things. You all have gifts and skills and talents. And it's just about connecting the dots and helping you figure out, okay, based on who I am and how I'm wired, how can I best be utilized by God? So we want to help come around you in that. And I would say one of the greatest places where it's missed is in the workplace. Right? If you really think about it, a lot of us leave our discipleship, you know, becoming more like God, practicing on an hour on a Sunday morning. If we do once a week an hour in anything, probably not going to be very good at it. Right? But when you spend 40, 50, 60 hours at work and you start having that mindset of, okay, God, what are you up to today? You know, that conversation now that you have with that person, I think it takes on new meaning. I'm telling you, I've had more, more encounters with people just from having that mindset because now when I greet that person and I go up to that person, I'm, I'm having my spiritual ears on and I'm just listening differently. And if there's a whisper there, maybe how, how can I pray for you? How can I meet that need in your life? What, whatever that is, I mean, that's the organic part of it, right? That's the spirit-led part of that. But if we start to practice that more and more in our workplaces, the example that you're setting, the, um, the, the, uh, the values that you're bringing forth, you're adding value to those around you. You come in with the mindset, what can I get out of it, versus how can I bless other people? God calls us in Genesis to be image bearers and blessing givers. Right, so every day, how can I bear his image and be a blessing giver to those around me? And each of you, if each of you takes that as an individual, as you go forth into your community, into your families, my gosh, what can God do in us and through us? So as a church, we want to be able to support you in that. Okay? Any questions on that one? At any time, you can interrupt me. So if something spurs you on. But that's like when we think it through the individual we're really saying, how can we come alongside and support you in figuring out how God can best utilize you? All right? Yes. Can you grab the mic? Uh, Hello? Now I can have this. So earlier you said thing. about being a consumeristic, you know, the, the attitude of being a consumer when we come on on Sunday, and I just kind of wanted to, you know, not being a consumer, although we all have our own needs, but I just wanted to connect what you just said about <clears throat> how the opposite of true when we go out into our community at work, whatever it is, when we take what we get here, because we are consumers and at the same time we are ministering on Sunday, all of us but also taking what we, we get here. I just want to make that connection that we are be, being equipped on a Sunday and then going 
to a consumer during the week so that we are dispensing our relationship with Christ. And that, that's, to me, the key, you know? So I don't know if that makes sense, or maybe you can clarify that a little bit. Well, there's bit. a receiving that takes place, but I also, if I forget, remind me to say sharing of our stories, because I'll talk about sharing stories are very important. Yes, so I would hope that all of us come with a receiver mentality. I, I wouldn't call that a consumer, but, but we are coming to receive. I would hope that we receive from the music, from one another, from God's word, from the teaching, from talking with each other, right? From all different ways when you come here. That's why we pass the mic around, because I don't want one perspective to be like, oh my gosh, that's the perspective. It's just my perspective, and you all have much value to add. And so as we hear from one another, I think that we grow better. And then as we take what we're taking in, right, we want to then bring it out. And, and so whatever you're learning here, so if we go back to that, this idea of compassion, if we're talking about compassion here at church, and we highlight a ministry, we highlight a story of someone doing that, hopefully it encourages all of us as individuals that when we go out, like, how can I be compassionate? To what person can I show compassion, right? And it's in that, that's the beauty of it. But then, and I believe a lot of you do that on a regular basis, but then the importance of sharing the story is if we don't hear about it, it's hard to encourage the whole body, right? So I want to get better at collecting those stories. We do, we, we do a pretty good job of having you come up here, you know, and, and sharing stories from the front. Just It's a source of encouragement and inspiration, right? Because it's talking about real life examples about how you're showing up and taking what you're learning and applying it. And when you hear someone else's story, you go, I can do that too, right? And, and so I want that just to become part of our rhythm, right? And our DNA and our culture. So beautiful. Anything else on that? Okay. So this, it, it actually leads into the, the church-wide initiatives, right? If you think about the individual, then from a church-wide perspective, I want to offer opportunities for you all to get involved because I know, again, this is being intentional yet organic. If I just talk about it a lot, you're all busy, right? We all lead busy lives. And it's hard to, to then live out the gospels and be the good news around us without having like a catalytic thing, right? So I think that it's important for the church to provide catalytic events, service projects, classes, whatever, all the different things so that it kind of, it, it continues to uh, bring awareness to us. So for example, if we go to Greenlock, right? Greenlock Therapeutic Riding Center. Um, some of you may not know it. That's a place in Rehoboth where th there's, there's a business and they're a nonprofit that gives back to kids who have severe disabilities and they use the horses to provide hippotherapy. And so we'll take maybe 30, 40, 50 people and we go down there and we just help them clean up the grounds and get it so that they can do what they do better. Why we do that is for those 50 people that show up, something happens to you, right? It's, it's, you feel good about showing up and giving of yourself to a cause that's greater than yourself. And so I hope what, by doing that, if you show up, it's like I hope there's built in momentum to that. So then again, organically, through the Spirit, that then every day it builds into your everyday life, that there's this rhythm where God can use you. And so I think they play off of each other. And so we're trying to be very strategic in the, the, the types of things that we offer. Now, here's the other side of this. Um, you've heard me say this before. I don't want to be a program-driven church, right? Because I believe that a lot of churches, and this isn't a judgment on churches, it's just I feel like it's a philosophy. And it's, a, it's like if you can get the church people to come to church on a regular basis, somehow they'll be better at being the church. And I'm sitting there going, you all only have so much time to give. And I want you, I would love for you to make this a rhythm to come on Sunday mornings. I think that's important, right, to carve out that time. And then sometimes we'll do groups throughout the year, right? And I think that's very important to carve out that time so that you can grow with each other. Um, but if I go, oh, you know what? Every month we're going to do a, a, a men's breakfast, every, every, and then we're going to have a women's breakfast, and then we're going to have a, a women's retreat, and then we're going to have a Bible study, and then we're going to have this service project. You know, if I give you 30 things, I'm going to, yes, those are all good things, but I'm keeping you very, very busy in church. And I'm not doing a very good job of helping us to be the church. Does that make sense? So, uh, you know, strategically, we're always trying to figure that, that balance out. And again, I'll say over the last two and a half years, we've assessed that, and I feel like we haven't offered enough, right? So I went to one side of it and said, all right, we're, we're, we're not going to offer a lot of things, 
and we're going to um, help people to uh, hopefully get it, right? And, and again, without sharing the stories, I don't know how much is getting in or not, but I believe that because of the stuff that I shared in week one, that a lot of it is, you know, we're doing a really great job of being the church. So we're going to keep doing some of those things. But so, for example, um, we have partners where we do types of catalytic things. We just did the Bags of Hope, so that's the easy one to just talk about that. Um, we team up with Matheson. So this is Jerry. Jerry, raise your hand. Jerry goes to Matheson Street every Sunday. Mark, raise your hand. Mark goes uh, once a month and leads music there. Some of you volunteer there. And why we do this is because when we talk about um, going to the fringes, if you will, like when I study the scriptures, I really believe that Jesus spent a lot of his time on the fringes of society. He wasn't going to the most popular people. He was hanging out with people that other people would not hang out with. And I, you see them in our society all the time. So one of the people groups is those that struggle with homelessness. And we say we want to be a church that brings respect and dignity and love to these folks. But not just that. We want to actually help them to no longer be homeless. So Matthewson does a great job of providing them with a breakfast every single Sunday, right? And they do music and stuff like that. So that's one niche that we can come alongside them and what they're doing and support their mission. But our, my vision and our vision at this church is to help one person no longer be homeless. And then two people, and then three people, right? And so Jerry goes every single week, and he gets to know people, gets to know their story. And it's so, um, I feel it's such a, I don't even know the right words for it, but it brings so much dignity and respect and love and worth into their lives by just going and get to know them with no agenda. He has zero agenda except to care for them. So last night, he shared with me and said, there's a man, um, he has no arms, right? He has no arms. And, it's like, and he's telling me uh, about, he went over his house and, and did dishes. Going, so as an individual, woohoo, great. But as a church now, right, I'm sitting around there, how as a church could we be more effective? What if we had a, a, a system in place that said, any one of you that's interested in helping with the homeless, we have five initiatives that you can plug into. One of them would be going over this, young, this man's house and helping him clean up. I'm like, that would be such a, to me, a small thing, but a huge thing. A way of, like, and, and he's saying as he's cleaning up, he's talking to the guy, right? And he's having conversations. So there's so much, I believe, that God smiles on that, and there's so much goodness happening by washing dishes. Yeah, and so the, Jerry's like, I got a strategy for you. Instead of, using, <laughs> instead of using real plates, use paper products, right? So that's another one. We could buy the paper products. Um, but, it, but there's stories like this that I, we could go on and on, but without the infrastructure from a church-wide perspective to be able to get you this information, get an easy way for you to kind of check off, yeah, I'd like to know more about that, and then get you to... The, the right initiative to participate, we need to do better at that. So this year we're really focusing from a church-wide perspective, how can we implement the right systems and teams to make us more effective? Does that make sense? Okay, now I could go with that. We do that at Greenlock. We do that at Baldwin Elementary School in Pawtucket. We do that here at the Highlander Charter School. We do that at Four Echoes. That's the, the business that we have. Um, we've had people come in from Boys Town for foster care. We've had safe families and, and kids come in here to say, how can we get involved there? We do it with mentoring, internships. So, I mean, I could go on and on, and it's you all being the church in these different ways. So, keep it going, all right? But that's why we partner with different organizations so that then we can be the church. So, here at Highlander, right? Why we're here, over 70% of the kids that come here are from inner city Providence. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at it and say, what are the, what are the issues? What are their needs? And then how can we come alongside? So, we have to provide mentoring and internship opportunities. So, internships is a career thing. It changes their life if we can give them a job where they're making thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year instead of selling drugs or selling themselves to prostitution. Right? So it's an endeavor that we want to come alongside so that we can give real hope to kids who are struggling in the inner cities. I could go on and on, not gonna, but get a, I think you get a flavor of that. Um, I'll add one more thing because from a church-wide perspective, an area that I think we gotta get better at is adding more connection points. 
So I mentioned that earlier. So we want to provide different experiences for you to get involved in. So some of you have been here for a while. We've offered like twice a year, we do like maybe a four or six week series. And we just ask people to offer up their homes. So like after this series is over, we're actually going to be getting into one. And so that's an opportunity for people to say, hey, you know, people can use my home. You have people come over and we provide a DVD and some questions and you have discussion and, and food together. It's pretty laid back, pretty simple, but pretty powerful. And it helps when new people come to the church to have a place to get connected, right? To get to meet new people. And so I've been reading this book. What's it called? I'll, I'll, push, you. I'll push you. I'll push you. And in this book, it talks about a, a, a man who had a disease that's um, over time, it's almost like Lou Gehrig's where, um, or Parkinson's or those types of diseases, like he started losing movement in his feet and then in his legs and then to the point where he can only talk. You know, he, he has no movement in his arms and anything like that. And so it's about these two guys who, who are best friends. And what I love about this book is it to me, it gives a, a biblical uh, view of community. Like that authentic, we're gonna talk about this next week, this authentic community. But connection points are so important because if you think about it, every single human being God put in us, we're wired for community. So every person that walks through these doors is looking to belong to something. They're looking to be accepted. They're looking to be loved on, cared for, and then also challenged and inspired because we're wired to, to make a difference as well. Right? And so if we come in and we provide these opportunities to get to know each other better. So this guy, they go on a pilgrimage and it's a 500-mile pil pilgrimage, and they get their friend a special wheelchair. You know, it's like the, the one wheel and the two wheels, and it can navigate the terrain and stuff like that. And on this pilgrimage, the story just unfolds, and all these things that happen with perfect strangers, and they get to know their story. It all happened because he's willing to share his story. He's willing to be vulnerable. And it's while people coming alongside them and helping them overcome the ch different challenges and obstacles of this pilgrimage. And it just got me thinking, and I'm not saying we're going to 100% do this, but it's like, what if we created opportunities for pilgrimage hikes where we spent a, a night and a half to that together? You get to know each other so well, and you just walk together. And there'll be built-in challenges in that, right? And you just go on a hike together. I mean, it's just an idea, right? It's just one, one idea. But it's, again, from a church-wide perspective, what could we put forth that gets us out of the rhythm of the life that keeps us so inundated and busy that we don't even know people. Just ask yourself this question. How many people do you actually know intimately outside of your spouse if you're married? Don't answer that, but just think about that. And if you read this book, it takes it to a whole nother level of intimacy and vulnerability. And it inspires me because it's like you have to get out of your own way to trust another person to be vulnerable and to share your story and to share your th the things that you struggle with. But that happens, it doesn't usually happen when you're just going 100 miles an hour. It usually happens when you're sitting around a table with a cup, glass of wine, or a coffee table, or on a hike, something like that. So we wanna create opportunities for you to do that. Any questions? The next one is Highlander, so I kinda just talked about that. Um, so we team up with here, we work with the principal here, and we just try to provide opportunities for mentoring, internships, give them community service hours. Um, and then this is our, my way of saying as a church, we can provide them with real hope. So I'm not gonna go into that any further. We talked about that. The next one is working with local businesses to attach a cause. This one is a very interesting one because this one I feel like it's kind of like God breathed into us by how we started. And we had a lot of um, business owners in the church. And I just said to myself, if you really think about it, how can the church be present in the community and start to help these, these for-profit businesses to build the kingdom, right? So the, the easy illustration is the bags of hope. If you can have, go up to 50 different businesses and say, hey, will you care about foster care? All I'm asking you to do is put 10 ornaments in your, in your storefront. And when people ask you about it, sell an ornament, tell them about the story. Right? And think about the number of causes that we can bring into the community to make a difference. So some of the things we've done over the last year was back to school supplies, backpacks for the homeless, kindness rocks. We did signs for suicide prevention. We do internships. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways for, we, for us to come along local businesses and also other schools and other churches to get involved in this and attach causes to what we're already doing. 
And so I feel like that kind of raises the whole tide, if you will, because there's such a divide between church and the rest of the world. And it shouldn't be that way. The church should be integrated into all of society. And if you really think about it, we're removed, right? And so how can we get more integrated into real life, into society, in a, in a, in a way that adds value? All right, and then the next one is... Sean. Say again. Can I say something? Whoa, yes. I know. <laughs> That was powerful. I am your father. So um, just on that note, I wanted to mention something that I think several of you are, have done or are doing with your businesses um, to think outside the box. So maybe not just attaching a cause in that way that you're giving money outside of the business, but to actually take a chance and a risk um, and employing some of those individuals that may be on the fringes and that's risky. Those are, those are folks that are, you know, they may not be reliable. They may not, uh, they may not show up when they're supposed to. They, you know, but if we can really think about reaching out to the fringes and helping those folks get employed and, um, you know, get a, a, a background so that they can then go out and, and do something more, um, and I know several of you are doing that or have done that. And um, so to think outside the box a bit with your own business or your employers in ways that maybe you can help to um, provide jobs for, you know, folks on the fringes is something to really um, think about. Yeah, saying that um, on that level. So some of that is maybe working with kids, um, not kids, with adults that struggle with homelessness. Some of that we'll, we'll talk in the subsequent weeks about um, helping kids that age out of the foster care system that need jobs. Um, and then also the kids that are here, the inner city youth, because I'm always like in that process of how can I get this young person a job? That's what they need for their future, right? That's real hope. It's not just a theory of hope. It's real hope. And if you're in a situation where you can raise that bar at your place of work, whether you're the owner or not, you can go to the owner. You can go to the, the, the person who's going to be doing the hiring and envision them with this. Okay, um, and then obviously, so for us to kind of lead, the, lead by example in this, part of our vision is to start a business, and, and I should say that plural. You know, we want to start multiple businesses, so we, the first one we did is Four Echoes at Grist Mill Pond in Seekonk, and Kara uh, is, is running that right now, and, and she's raising up people to run it, and then we'll go and do another one. And, the reason, and that, that's awesome because we get community service hours there, we, do, we can do internships there, we can do all the things that we just talked about. You know, where we get some of the students coming from here to go over there, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like the more businesses that we have, the more opportunities we get to live this out. And, um, and it also can help people in the church too, right? Because there's going to be people that struggle getting jobs in the church as well. So it's just like this beautiful um, way that God has blessed us to be able to take on um, this kind of a business, which is like a vendor-based business, and it's also a donation-based business, that we can then replicate that. And I think that we can do that very well over the next... 20 years. You know? So again, um, I don't want to spend too much time on these things, but I think you can see that this provides us with ways to, to be the church. So um, I think Misty was just sharing with me about some folks that went through the store, you know, and she's just talking about this, this exchange that they're having on a very human level. And, and to me, that's like, I'm like, that's perfect. That's like you being the church through the business. You know, and there's like story after story after story about how that happens on a regular basis. And so we want to just be able to continue to do that. Any questions on that? And then lastly, and I'll, be, I'll close quickly with this, is our global initiatives. And we, this is a you know, space that we haven't developed much at all. We're looking, the one thing that I'll say is under global initiatives, there's a thing that I want to create is Charity Water. Some of you may have heard of that, um, that endeavor. They, they do a great job of raising awareness throughout the world with you know, third world countries that struggle with water. It's just like this huge, huge issue. Clean water, how long it takes. People take six to eight hours a day just to get their water, get it clean, to be able to use it, et cetera. And so there's an organization called Charity Water that, that uh, helps raise monies to help with that. So what I'd like to do is create through the school an experience, like a live exhibit of, so it's like an educational experience. So we could collaborate with all the schools around the area. We could also make it so that people just from the towns can come to the property, both inside and outside the property. So I'm thinking like in, maybe in the spring or early fall to do this 
so that we can just raise awareness in our communities about the plight of what happens in real life. In, in, every, in these people's lives, every single day, this happens. We are so fortunate and so blessed that we don't feel the pain of that, right? And so, again, we make everyone better around us by talking about kingdom issues. And if we can be creative with that and create experiences that people come through, they get to see questions and see real life things. Of what to, like I was thinking, like, have people carry a, a five-gallon jug of water on their head, fill it up, and walk a couple hundred yards with it, and then bring it to a filling station. Just a simple little object lesson, but it could change a person's life. Go, I didn't realize that this is so, and they have to do that for two miles. They're not doing it for 200 yards. They're doing it for two miles, right? And you just have this exchange. And so, um, and, and we can do different things with mission trips and stuff like that. So enough. Lord, we thank you. We're humbled by your grace and your goodness. We're humbled by, you know, I would suggest that we're a fairly small church, yet very, very powerful. I see us being the church in some remarkable ways. And I just keep dreaming before you, God, asking you, using us, God, building your church. Help us to listen. Help us to be humble. Help us to be willing. We want to make a difference. We want to see your kingdom come. Your will be done. Bring in heaven to earth, God. Use us. Build us up. May you receive all the glory. Love you and we worship you.